Hello and welcome to Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. I'm Dale Crowley. And I'm Michael Sweet. And today we are very honored to have with us Rob Kohler, a composer for film and television who's currently working on the hit TBS comedy, The Detour, starring Jason Jones and written by Samantha B. This is a fantastically hilarious comedy. It was Rob's work and unique folk rock sound from He's My Brother, She's My Sister that caught the eye of director Steve Pink, who directed the pilot episode of The Detour. And the rest is history as Rob will now be scoring the second season of The Detour as well. Welcome, Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Kohler. And Rob is an incredible composer who's worked on films uh, like Peace, Love, and Misunderstanding and currently working on The Detour, which is starring Jason Jones, and it's also written by Samantha Bee. It has a fantastic and very eclectic score, and we're really looking forward to playing some of those songs and listening, getting your process on how you've created some of those songs. Uh, but before we get started with that, let's go ahead and uh, get a little bit of background about you and your musical background. How did you get started in music? So uh, when I was about 13, I begged for an electric guitar for my parents for a Christmas present. Didn't get it till a few months later. And uh, just been writing songs pretty much since then. Started in bands in high school. There wasn't much of a scene. I grew up in this little town called La Cunada, just outside of LA. And there wasn't really anywhere to play clubs. So we took the community center in our local town and we turned it into this like weekend club for all the weirdo kids. <laughs> so just kind of a lot of DIY, you know, I grew up on a lot of punk. So it was always producing how to, we didn't, we couldn't afford producers sometimes to produce our own records, create our own music. So it definitely came from that and evolved over time into different bands. So I played in a rock band, Lemon Sun, kind of a folk rockabilly band. He's my brother, she's my sister. And through that band and the music I wrote for that band, I got the opportunity to score this television show, The Detour. Fantastic. We'll definitely want to get into that and that how, how that would, discovery happened. But uh, yeah. before that, tell us about one of your earliest memories uh, with music. My earliest, I was in love with this girl, Caroline, in middle <laughs> school. We did one of these Washington, D.C. trips, yeah. and we all went out to D.C. And Caroline, it was like early 90s, so she had like Doc Martens up to her knees, like dyed like maroon hair. She was like super cool and hot. And I was kind of getting into music, and she had like the best CD collection of anyone in our class. And I really wanted to impress her. So it, it, it kind of got me inspired like to get into music and learn about music and, and kind of show her that I knew a little bit. So I went on this rampage of discovering music and all this, of course, Caroline broke my heart a few weeks later. <laughs> so then it, it transitioned from this music collection into, well, what am I gonna do with my heartache? So I picked up my guitar and started writing songs about, uh, about my woeful situation. Great, and are you self-taught? Uh, mostly, I took a few lessons here and there, but uh, mostly self-taught and kind of picked up uh, information and knowledge along the way through uh, working. I worked for a composer for a while, Stephen Endelman, so he taught me a lot and he's done a lot of films and, and scoring. And then, yeah, through jamming, through different bands, you always learn from different musicians. So always uh, trying to, to uh, to have that relationship with a lot of different musicians, pick up little pieces of information, whether it be learning about inverting, inverting chords or you know different progressions that different artists like to use. So uh, yeah, it's been a mixture of things, but mostly self-taught. In terms of uh, kind of the transition into uh, from from songwriting and being in these bands into uh, uh, your first sort of uh, uh, music for media, right? Can you talk a little bit about that and how you might interweave songwriting into your process and how it differs from maybe the underscore that you write. Absolutely. So I've been a fan for a long time of guys like Mark Mothersbaugh and uh, Danny Elfman. So I've always looked, I've for a long time, even as a songwriter, I hoped to make that transition. And so when I listen to their work, I hear a lot of songwriting composition infused into their score. So that there's a lot of awareness of melodic hook and structure that to me is reminiscent of a song and it makes their music very listenable. It's effective because they support the visual of the film very well and the cinematic emotion very well. But I feel like it, it, as a listener, it's important to have this structure that 
is also very listenable and enjoyable. So I always love to incorporate that. I lo I'd love if a, a, a piece of music can can be enjoyable and, and, and evoke emotion separate from the visual as much as possible. And I think that pop songwriting um, gets infused into that and helps support that that goal. I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but that's where yeah, my mind went. <laughs> it definitely does. And maybe you want to, so um, I, I want to talk a little bit about something else that you said, which is that you worked with uh, as an assistant composer for Stephen Edelman, right? Right. Can you talk about how that influenced or, or maybe changed your perception of how you look at uh, a visual medium uh, in comparison to, say, songwriting and things like that? Absolutely. I mean, when I first got into it and working, so I was an assistant to Stephen in New York, um, and he was working on that at that time on a couple films um, that I was helping him score. And uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the one with Pierce Brosnan said in Ireland, and it's just a Evelyn. Evelyn. Yeah. And so I did some guitar work on Evelyn, and. I had I really had no idea how it would work with the screen and didn't realize that he's composing a lot with the visual there and using the visual as that inspiration. So that was very new to me and realizing, I mean, there's a, a lot of ways to go about it. A lot of composers have that visual and then use the visual to evoke a certain melody and 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 inspire them into creating this piece of music. In the detour, interestingly, I pulled the scripts and I didn't want to see the visual as much because I wanted them to have music ahead of time to cut to. So in the detour, which is a little different than I think the way Stephen tends to work, we used a lot of the score I'd sent ahead of time and they basically cut to it and used the score as temp music. So my idea was let's give them a bunch of music to use as temp music so that if I'm recreating music, I'm recreating my own music and not having to almost chase other people's tracks or chase other music. And I feel like a lot of times composers' pieces get watered down in that way because you, the producer and the director fall in love with this temp music because it's attached to the visual and they get used to it. Humans like to feel comfortable. They, they feel comfortable with a piece that they're used to. And then it's like, well, we can't afford that or we can't use that piece of music because it's not our score. Can you do something similar? And I didn't want to be caught in that because I feel artistically as a composer, it, you're a bit neutered at that point. You're a bit like boxed. And so I really love this approach and I'm hoping in future projects to do this where I try and score as much as I can ahead of time and even give them too much music, even though it ends up being a lot of work in the beginning for me. In the end, I feel like it balances out. And to me, it's more important to, to have that artistic integrity. Um, one one so follow-up question well, that I want to say. I think that's really intriguing. And I think it's kind of, um, it's it's more similar to, I think, how, how uh, game composers score for, uh, for games, because a lot of times they're working without visuals. I wanted to ask, just in mm. terms of the score that you did for that, when you got the scripts and you were reading them, when you were writing sure. pieces of music, were you writing them for a specific scene or more like an emotional component that, that then would go in maybe multiple places? Or uh, did you think about themes at all or, or things like that? That's a great question. So we we built the, the main theme of the show is actually built off of the main title song, which was kind of cool that I was able to write the main title song and then use some of the musicality and and melody of that and infuse it into the score of the show. But in the midst of all that, I was also in the studio like kind of a mad professor. Just the way I like to work a lot of times is I'll feel like you were saying, it, it's this emotion that I'm kind of going for. So, and something to sum up, in a way I want the music to have, to not be exclusively one character or exclusively necessarily one emotion, but kind of capture what the feeling of the show is entirely, but then lean towards a certain direction. So in other words, like I want an identity that's the show musically, a musical identity of the show. But then if, if we're pushing a certain emotion, it leans that way. But I always want that identity to remain intact to some degree. So in the beginning, it was just like throwing paint at the wall, you know, like Pollock just like splattering and, <laughs> and hope and, and kind of hoping 
something would land and work. And and at times, Jason, there was a moment where Jason was, I could, he never said this specifically, but he was a little bit like, can we kind of folk, like, let's hone in on the one, th the melodic theme we have going. Like, we have a good thing going, and you're right. And, he, and of course, I was like, of course, you're right. I, I was overcomplicating it in a way. But it took a lot of kind of experimentation to, to get that, then like cut the, trim the fat, and then hone in. And then at a certain point, you just know, I feel like instinctively, there was this character, this kind of detour monster of music that was created, a Frankenstein of like, and in, mo in many ways it included tap dancing. My wife tap dances on a lot of the scores. So there's this clackety, clackety rhythm, roto toms, which I've never used before, but they're, they're musical toms. So it's, there's something kind of playful and fun about t a variety of toms, like drum toms, but they actually have no notes. So you can almost create little melodies with the drums. And then, you know, typical like, bass and then some sort of surfy psychedelic guitar to give it a little bit of zaniness and then occasional castanets a few other instruments but that sort of after a lot of uh experimentation became the identity for most of the score those instruments very very cool for those that don't know about the detour it's a top uh, comedy new comedy on tbs and uh there's a you're going to be uh scoring the 2016 the new version that's coming out uh when is that starts this spring or this this they, uh, this autumn? I just talked to Jason today. They're shooting it in July, August, September. So then we'll be in post. So I assume it'll come out next spring. The you're talking about season two, right? Right. Yeah, I th I'm assume I'm assuming those kind of plan it around the same. So the last one was released, I think, in April or May. No, it was April, I think. So mm -hmm. uh, probably April, March or April next year. Very cool. And so let's roll the clock back a little bit. You mentioned Lemon Sons. He's my brother. She's my sister and now the Kolars, sure. and then how, how did that get you this uh, film, this, the, the TV scoring gig? So Steve Pink, yep. fantastic guy, he directed the first few episodes of the show, of The Detour. Mm -hmm. Jason and him were working on Hot Tub Time Machine, I think the sequel, right. and Steve did uh, High Fidelity, he was mm -hmm. involved in, and Gross Point Blank, and some films that I'm really inspired by great films yeah love i mean high fidelity. including hot tub time machine by the way <laughs> the first that. one i haven't actually seen the, the second one, one. Yeah, sorry I have. Steve. Yeah, yeah but uh the first one I, I i think it's kind of an underrated comedy it's got it some great elements too i think it's really funny great soundtrack yeah. um steve's a very talented guy and he's got great taste in music i don't want to toot my horn too much but <laughs> he reached out saying he was a fan of the band and it was one of those funny situations because I was literally at that time in my life, the band had decided to go on hiatus from touring. My sister had a kid, which is a wonderful thing. But at the same time, you're trying to keep this momentum of the band going. And you're sort of like, OK, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I had this horrible uh, hand injury where I severed the tendons in my mm -hmm. finger. I thought I, it might affect my whole composing, piano playing, guitar playing. And I was going through the process of healing from that. And it was a really traumatic and intense injury. And, you know, a, a, there were a lot of issues going on. I don't want to get too personal with financial things. But I was sort of like, what the, what the F am I going to do now? I get this email. I show it to my wife. And she's like, Steve Pink. Oh, my God, I'm a huge fan. Are you sure this is a real email? Like, is this spam? Is, can, should we, is there a way to, like verify that this is like a real deal um sure enough it was and and steve steve was so funny because he like lists his credits in the email because we'd never spoken before ironically he'd gone on a trip with my dad to columbia two years ago but wow. he had no we had no idea yeah they, they went on a, like a scouting thing for film um because my dad works in film but Steve, so Steve sends me this email with uh, with his, some of his credits and just out of the blue, do you want to try your hand? I like your band. I like the music you've created for He's My Brother, She's My Sister. Would you like to try your hand at scoring? It's this road trip comedy. We think the music of He's My Brother put in more of a, a, a cinematic scored format could work really well, you know, almost score it like a band would be scoring it. Right. Um, and I said, well, yeah, I'm not doing very much right now. <laughs> Please. Like, so I had to, but of course I had to jump through a few hoops, you know, like I'm not a known composer. I was, uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't then. So 
they had to get approval from the execs, from Jason, from a number of people. So it was sort of like, I felt like every week I'd be like, okay, got through that one, you know, next week, are they going to be okay? You know, and then I'd send them some music, send them some ideas. And luckily they were really excited about the stuff I sent. So that helped a lot. And here I am talking to you guys. Wow. That's a great story. So in terms of, uh, uh, genres of, of kind of different media, right? Um, uh, you uh, Most sort of c cinematic stuff, you go see a film, there's a lot of serious stuff out there, and, and uh, the, the show that you worked on has a lot of comedy, yes. and it's, it may support, you know, the, the style of music that you, that you write. Do you, do you want to keep doing comedies? Do you want to, you know, and, and now that you've done comedy, do do people look at you as oh the comedy composer he does mm. so do you do you have um are you challenged by that in any way uh, maybe you could talk a little bit because i know there are a lot of composers when they do their you know either their first project it's like oh that composer only does x you know and, right. and navigating those waters have you experienced that or do you want to talk a little bit about I, it that's a great thing and i often think about it i haven't experienced it yet i think because i'm a new fairly new composer it's our first season luckily there's been some great response to the music and the show so i'm hoping you know it'll generate some more opportunity but absolutely um on the one hand so going back to the beginning of your question comedy is a wonderful thing to score because in the very in the very simplistic almost like literal sense that you spend this much time watching the visuals and the footage if you're going to be laughing while you're doing that great because i mean i can imagine scoring like a really dense heavy dramatic serious or even violent show and you're seeing, you're watching that constantly and you're spending so much time like engrossed in that world, you could kind of go the way at the end of the day feeling like, you know, a little bit heavy yourself emotionally. Like I think good composers put their energy and life into the work and they feel that emotionally. So working on a comedy is fantastic in that sense that I'm laughing every day and there's some new footage that's all, you know, and luckily the show's well written and Jason's a funny guy and there's some great scenes. So in that sense, I love working on comedy and a, and a 30 minutes great because it's quick. There's a lot of, I love that transition. There's constantly movement. There's always a new piece to work on. And this show, especially we get to create original songs and that's my favorite thing to do. I mean, I adore scoring. It's, it's such a thrill and it's such a wonderful way to create, but creating original songs, which also can work in a cinematic scoring way is, is to me like the most exciting thing. And we were able to do that a few times on the show. Um, but in terms of transitioning, I would love to do more uh, whimsical sort of maybe sci-fi, uh, something a little bit more, I don't know, dreamy or, 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 or esoteric in terms of the style of the score. And I hope to transition that I try and, infuse a little bit of that into the detour but i think jason likes to keep things a little more grounded which is great it works for the show but yeah eventually and how to do that i think just continuing to create and and may, I, I, it may sound a little hippie but i think if you put it out there you 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 focus on what you desire and what and you even work on, on it yourself i think for other composers who are watching this if you if you start creating that music i truly believe the universal find an opportunity for that music to find a home. So if, if you are pursuing that and you envision like, this is really the kind of piece I wanna be working on. This is the kind of music I wanna be creating. This is the kind of world I wanna be involved in. And you can really visualize that and sonically uh, bring it into fruition. I think that it will happen. It may take a minute, it may take some time, but it will, you will get those opportunities. Yeah, in terms of comedies, normally comedies are focused entirely on the dialogue, something like Modern Family. There's almost no score. But mm. there are other shows like 30 Rock and, of course, The Detour, yes. where you've got music as part of the comedy. So you've got a lot of montage, you've got a lot of driving scenes and so on. So there's a, a lot of more opportunity in a show like, like Detour for you to really stretch your wings and write these original songs or write based on lyrics that Jason sends you. 
Absolutely. And yeah, that's the great thing about the show. In a cool way, we tried, though, at times, um, that being said, like we were both fans of The Office and, and Modern Family. Mm -hmm. And there were times where we would say, like, let's let's pull the music out here. And I think it's really important. And, and sometimes they would even be pushing for it. And I'd be like, please, no score. Like the scene works so well dry and it almost leaves the audience kind of in that a slightly uncomfortable place sometimes silence to me is just as important or more important than the score so i think it's it's great and in the show and jason was very much for that in a lot of ways we would just pull it out but then when you have that moment like you were saying like a driving scene or a montage scene that's the moment to shine so that was when i was like all right i gotta step it up cool. but there was a lot of times where it's like let's lose the music like lose these pieces lose the score and i think the balance of that works well because it allows the music to shine in its moments and then let the actors and the dialogue shine when it's that moment you know so rob can you talk a little bit about the process of the lyric writing that goes on for the show and sure. are are you writing those lyrics is is someone in the show writing those lyrics and passing them off is a collaborative process and then how how do um those lyrics uh, you know fit in with those scripts right so most of the songs the, the original songs we wrote for the show jason uh, jones who's the actor producer writer does a number of wears a lot of hats on the show he will send he would send me lyrics and just be like what do you think about a song in this situation so the first one we did was there's this uh, uh an episode called the restaurant and it's set in this conquistador like really politically incorrect restaurant and he sent me these lyrics called we it, the titles we won um as currently being considered for emmy so cross fingers why don't we play that right now okay and then, yeah. then you can talk about it right so this song is like a musical, it's a musical theater performed by the actors in the restaurant for the dining families that come by this roadside attraction. So they're all sitting there watching these conquistadors triumphantly sort of frolic across the stage. And it's all really in poor taste, but done in this deliberate way to kind of expose, which is of course meant to be Tenochtitlan. We pronounced it wrong. I told people. Let's get our ravages on and stately men of Christ have saved us all from sacrifice. And now they fill our wounds with light. Turn our skin from brown to white. We Very politically incorrect. Yes, very. So Jason wrote these lyrics, and immediately I started thinking, oh, okay, it has to be this sort of triumphant, almost like, I mean, I didn't want it to be too jokey, so I wanted to feel like it was these, I was imagining, so I was, when I try and create these songs, I imagine like, where are they coming from? Like, who actually created this song? Because I don't want it to sound like, a guy who's composing a show created this song for the show to be a comedy piece. So I'm thinking like, okay, this restaurant, they have a little bit of a budget. They hire these local musicians and maybe there's like a local composer in the town and he composes this piece and he gets the local choir to sing on it. And so I'm like, I want it to feel like this like local production, but done quite well. Like they put some money into it because they're like, this restaurant's going to be a hit. And so I literally got myself, I'm singing on it, and my friends into the studio. We all sang it in this room, actually, that I'm sitting in. And I got, one day, actually, we were having a party, and people were kind of drinking. I just said, guys, come in. Like, these are the lyrics. And so we had, like, 20 people in here singing, we won. We, and it's sort of <laughs> low great. in the background, but it just fills out the track. So in this case, I wanted to feel like almost like a, 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 somewhere on that line of like quality-ish production, but with like these cheesy elements that you would find and even instruments that weren't really conquistador, but you would, but someone who didn't have a lot of knowledge would think it was. So like this like strange flute, like I'm not sure that that's actually an instrument that they would use. The trumpets I think is actually pretty accurate, but I also tried to find sounds. Some of them are even like programmed sounds so that I, cause I could, 
have my friend play trumpet, but I feel like they wouldn't have used a real trumpet. They would have used this keyboard trumpet. So it's always about finding this balance of like just enough cheese and hokiness, but not pushing it to the extreme where it becomes way too farce. Let me play another one of my so. favorites here. This one's called Ride, and th this one you wrote the lyrics on. Yes, this is a different kind of example. So now I'm thinking about the days that I sold, got things on my And it's about the main character, right? Yes, so the lyrics to this one, um, Jason's character is, he, I think he means well, well, he, I think he definitely means well, but he kind of gets lost in his own befuddlement and his, he, he's, he's not exactly, he's, Jason's character is complex in a way because he, at times he's very stupid and at times he can be actually quite smart and innovative with some of his ideas. So I wanted to somehow capture that in a song and capture this idea of being caught up in your own lines. And I kind of just, it, it starts to unravel after a while. There's only so long you can kind of hold, especially from the people close to you, your wife, your kids, your family how long you can keep these secrets. So I wanted to find a charming way to give him the, the charm that Jason has, but also talk lyrically about how, you know, he's starting to lose his mind and kind of do it in this warm way that felt a little bit family and, and also had some of the, the, the music that I'm into. Because songwriting-wise, this to me, it has like hints of Wilco and like Spoon and Pavement and Lou Reed. And Lou Reed, these uh, are all influences and people I love. So I wanted to bring that into the show. This seemed like the best way to do that. Yeah, fantastic. Let's try another one here called How Am I Going to Get Back Home? Oh, right. Yeah. Another train. That percussion. Thanks. Oh, the uh, right. It's the. I'm trying to think of what the name of that is now. It's like a clapper. Yeah, vibraphone. Yeah, a clapper. <laughs> it's the. Uh, not vibraphone. It's a very comedic element. It's a yes, it is. Here and uh, Kate uses it a lot. I can't really believe I can't remember the name of that instrument. But yeah, you basically hit it and it, it creates this rattle sound. It's actually based off of, um, I don't know if it originated in Mexico, but the bones, they use this, and it creates a similar sound, is the, 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 the skull of, the mouth skull of mm -hmm. like cows and, and certain, and I think sheep, the, the teeth rattle you, and they, when you hit them and they use that as an instrument. And so this is sort of the more like, <laughs> and there's also a more modern. There's also a bluegrass violin uh, solo in there. It's a. Uh, it's actually a cello. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Satya Baba, who's a, 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 a established actor and used to be in our band, but he's been in New Girl and uh, several other shows. Uh, play cello. He was actually our cello slash bass player, so he would play the bass on a cello by plucking it and then play lead lines by uh, using the bow. Uh, so he was in the band at that time. He's since not in the band, he's pursuing his acting career. But he also plays on some pieces, some of the score as well, here and there, the cellos. Um, but yeah, that, so that song is He's My Brother, She's My Sister. Jason really liked that song, and I think it's used in an episode where they're like, cooking eggs really poorly with Jason and his wife. They're, they're staying at a guest house and they're just, they're killing these eggs. They're like way overcooking them. And it's like very expensive uh, pans and they're like using metal spatulas, great, like chipping into them. And it's just, they're, they're doing everything wrong, but that song sort of like happening is they're like happily like flipping eggs and stuff. And then of course you realize it's just a mess. Um, but it's about but them losing consciousness, right? <laughs> There you go. Yeah, you you pulled that one. I didn't think of that, but yeah, there is. There's always hints to to what's going on in their heads, and certainly Jason's psychology in the show. But I think he liked that one. I mean, that 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 was one of the songs and early tracks that we did. Is he's my brother that Steve got excited about and, and was into the show. I think Steve also liked this idea that 
He's My Brother, She's My Sister would be in the music, uh, would be in the score and be used in the show because also you have this sense of family. Our band is literally a family band with my wife being the drummer, my, uh, my sister being the other singer, and the show is literally a family show. So I think Steve also saw that connection and thought it'd be cool to include that. Right, and as Jason's character slowly loses his uh, mind uh, in the, during the course of the show, it reminds yeah. me of Breaking Bad and what Dave Porter did musically to represent what happened to the main character. And that's a show that your wife worked on, right, Michael? Yeah, uh, she's uh, one of the, uh, well, actually, she's working on Better Call Saul. So she didn't work on Breaking Bad, but yeah, she's working with, uh, um, on the new sort of spinoff series. And uh, Dave works on that show um, as a composer. Such a good show. Love Oh, it's one of my literally one of my favorite shows. I watch those that show, Enlightened, and a few others. I I watch right. and listen to the score and take a lot from in terms of uh, inspiration. But that show, Better Call Saul, is incredible. I think that could be a reason we don't uh, we don't get nominated for best comedy. This year. <laughs> it's just too many good shows, and Better Call Saul deserves it more than The Detour, in my opinion. So one of the things that you talked a lot about is is this sort of. Um, getting people in to your studio and, uh, you know, having mics up and recording. And I think um, your music, uh, there's a lot of shows that do a lot of electronic stuff and a lot of stuff in the box, right? And and the stuff that you're doing for this and the examples that we heard, it's very live sounding, you know, it, it definitely yeah. feels like. So can you just talk about your, like, what your setup's like, you know, what, you know, how you record, you know, what DAW you use? I think that would be really Absolutely. valuable for our, for our listeners. Absolutely. So I've used a few different over the years, but I, my go-to is Pro Tools. I feel like that set up well because I do a lot of live. I think um, a lot of composers who do more in the box or do uh, maybe electronic stuff tend to go with uh, Ableton or tend to go with uh, Logic, from what I've heard. Um, Pro Tools works for me. I think it's also because it's what I'm most used to. So I love Pro Tools. I use um, an ensemble, an Apogee ensemble. I'm about to replace that with an Apollo. Um, I love UA. I think UA makes the most incredible plugins. Even though I do do a lot of live stuff, I do also do a lot of in the box. And for all my um, reverbs, I mean, the, the EMT 140 reverb that UA makes is incredible. And I don't have space for like, an eight foot long box that weighs two tons, even though those sound amazing too. My friend has a real EM, EMT 140, but they sound amazing and AB them and there's very little difference. So UA has been a huge thing. And so I can't wait to get that Apollo. I actually bought it today. Um, I use a lunch box as well as some other pre's. So um, I use a, a pre, a 710 pre. I love Shadow Hills. So I have a uh, I have a, a Neve uh, lunchbox pre. So I have about five, six pre's that I'll interchange depending on vocals, instrumentation. Uh, I have two Shadow Hills compressors, which are incredible. The Shadow Hills Optograph I use on all vocals and bass. It just gives it this warm compression that it just, it, it seems to expand the sound but also cushion it the vandergraaf is this dual compressor which is great for uh drums you can even um, master with it it's good as a, as a master compressor um it, it's good on most things but the, the optograph's really great on vocals bass vandergraaf's really great on drums and any stereo compression you need so that's the general setup in that regard mic wise i love my sm7 because I hear dogs sometimes barking. I hear, I mean, I'm, it's a home studio, which I love because it gives me this freedom. And I also have a window. I can see the Hollywood sign from where I am. I can see trees. I feel like I'm in a tree house. So there's a nice energy to that. But the one thing is you sometimes have car horns and you have, so the SM7 allows me to capture a lot of vocals without a lot of outside noise. Right. But when I do want a bigger sound, um, like a wide diaphragm, I have a great blue Kiwi mic, which is really nice. It's a little crispy on the top end, so I have to roll off some EQ, but it works great. Um, and then I have a bunch of other mics. I like to collect uh, these nice. vintage mics. And then I have this guy, Mutant Mics. They they dig out the insides and change the capsules. And he even for stage shows, he puts lights 
in them. So if I use Phantom Power with these, they'll glow on stage. So it adds this nice effect. And of course, when I have singers in the studio and I throw up one of these, they get a, there's something exciting about singing into a mic that looks like this. And I feel like psychologically, that can be a really cool thing to inspire singers. Um, but as far as this collective thing, I love to bring in friends. I mean, all over. So we released an album of the soundtrack of season one. And all over that album, you have friends of mine guesting on guitars, guesting on vocals. If people are just happen to be around or in town, like my friend below has friends staying, musicians that tour through, they'll come up and I'll just try and get them on track. So it's very much this communal thing. And I like to have various personalities infused into those recordings. So that's one of the last thing that yeah. I wanted to ask you about in, in sort of wrapping up the, the sort of equipment, how you record portion is um, click like and because you're pre-scoring a lot, right, you, you kind of have some optional things, right? If you're pre-scoring scenes and material that that then gets en edited up, how often do you use click? Do you always use it? Is it optional? What what? How do you how do you Huge, kind of work that in? Hugely important question and vital to my world. Yeah, that's where I start. I begin with the tempo and the click, and that's so so crucial to the track. Sometimes it can get me into trouble because you know you you realize oh that's a little too quick or a little too slow, and so you almost I have to create a new piece or work around it. But generally, I try and find that tempo that sort of suits the emotion I'm after. And sometimes if I am scoring, there are were times through the show that I would score to picture. And in those moments, I would definitely try and find the tempo that fit that scene and just pace it. And it's an interesting thing because as a songwriter, you find that tempo that suits the song based on the emotion you're after and based on the melody of the song. With film, there isn't really a distinct rhythm you're seeing on the screen. So a lot of it's intuitive, which I love because you, you just have to kind of absorb what's going on and, and feel like, okay, this is the pace. So it's really up to the composer to kind of identify what that is. Um, one thing that was a little tricky in, in the detour, which is kind of an interesting side note, is we started the score with instrumentals of He's My Brother, She's My Sister. And He's My Brother, She's My Sister, our whole MO was no click. So we did our whole album, no click, Lauren just kind of created the tempo. But then when I'm trying to use those tracks mm. and edit them and editors are trying to edit Impossible. them, yeah. <laughs> it's, it makes it very tricky. So I made their lives a bit hard, not intentionally, but that was an interesting thing that, because that's how we started the score. And that kind of weaved its way into the original score that I then created. And that was all click. So it was kind of like, how do you maneuver from one world into another, but make it feel all uh, cohesive. Let me play one of those. Is the detour jazzy hop purple? Are those yes. purple, those are all cues that you were given, right? And the reason I use colors too, Jason was like, Why you, can you not come up with better names for some of these pieces? <laughs> and I was like, Jason, I wrote most of these before I seen anything, so I didn't really have, so I was like, let me use a color to represent the emotion. So like the purple songs tend to lean a little bit more minor, playful minor. The orange songs tend to be a little bit more happy. The red songs are a little bit more intense. The blue Never. songs are a little bit more mellow and kind of morose. So that was Jazzy Hot Purple. This is New Room. Oh, okay. New Room Awaits. Oh, okay, this is a fun one. restaurant episode okay they end up in this divey rest uh, not restaurant sorry the hotel episode they end up in this sort of divey hotel and muzak is going through the hotel the whole hotel so jason and brennan schroff who's directed a few episodes had this great idea they were like why don't we score a lot of this episode as muzak like you create, and I was like, I've never done music, but I was like, <laughs> yes, this is a fun challenge. Let's do it. So this piece is actually me interpreting a score as music. So almost thinking about that ble that bleeding line between music that's happening in the scene in the background yeah. and score, because so much of the episode 
is Muzak playing and some of its score I created. We even have a Muzak version of the main title theme. That's I'm Ooh. hoping like <laughs> Uber fans of the show will catch things. Like I've done that a few times throughout the season where I'll take a piece that's completely different stylistically and I'll reinterpret it with a different style of music almost as like little jokes or if music, you know, musos out there might catch it and be like, oh, that's funny. Like he took the main title and turned it into a music piece that's like really bad jazz happening <laughs> over this scene. So this is a music score uh, for when Jason's kind of going crazy and trying all these different rooms. A woman's having sex in one of them. Um, one of them's a closet. He basically can't find a good room. Cause so they're is it intentionally room. diegetic or is that sort of, do you have to, is it sort of in between? Good question. It's, it is definitely score, but it's meant to sort of stay in that oh, realm of, of, mu of music jazz that you might hear in a hotel room. So it's almost like, you're like, is that just playing? Does that happen to be playing? But it is score. Got it. Um, now let's try this one, the circus uh, purple. A lot of tap dancing. Here. Yes. Roto Toms, the clock. Yeah, there you go. So I'm a big fan of Sid Barrett and like psychedelic music. And I felt like this piece is definitely influenced with that sort of like those half step kind of chromatic changes and like this sort of off kilter, a little bit psychedelic, a little bit like zaniness was definitely influenced and that happens in a couple scenes like when the cop pulls them over in one of the scenes when things are kind of going ah, like that music has comes in a couple times throughout the series so that's a fun one excellent so rob one of the questions i wanted to ask you is about how you got into uh scoring for television and 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 and, and media and it relates to how you had this band and mm -hmm. that the, because of the band, you actually uh, were introduced to kind of the this show. Would you recommend that as a path to get into the industry is sort of develop your own, own artistry first and then bridge the gap or going directly into, say, television or whatever? Um, how what what advice do you have for up and coming composers? Absolutely. Um, well, of course, there's no distinct way and no guaranteed way. And I, I didn't expect to necessarily be here, but I definitely think having some kind of repertoire, even because I, I think a lot of there's a lot of great composers out there who aren't necessarily songwriters or band leaders or have bands. But I still think you can create incredible pieces of music that stand on their own. So maybe it's creating an album, creating finding visual that might work with your music and putting it on YouTube. Some way for people to explore and, ex and, and expose your music and, explore, and giving the people the opportunity to explore your music is really important because I think, A, it allows just more people to discover you and who knows who that could be. Someone creating a film that might see that piece of music and fall in love with it and say, this is exactly the mood for what I'm working on. So there's no real rhyme or reason. I think if you if you happen to be a songwriter and have a band and you want to become a composer and make that transition, I think it's worth considering that in some of your compositions. Maybe if you're creating an album, you include a couple of pieces that might even be instrumental compositions that showcase some of that work. Or within the song, you have some interesting string arrangements or some arrangements that show that you can do that kind of work. Um, but definitely at the end of the day, having work available and now with TuneCore and CD Baby you it's so easy to release your own music and it may take a minute there's a lot to compete with but if your music is really great and you do try and promote it you know in non-obnoxious ways <laughs> um, and just get it out there casually and encourage people to share it then I do believe it will rise to the top and people will find it and discover it. And at some point you, you'll have people wanting to collaborate. It sounds like there's almost uh, as many ways that you can get your, your music as a composer out into the world, the more opportunities that people have to, to kind of find mm -hmm. it. 
uh, as opposed to like a single method, like just putting stuff on a website or things like that. It limits in the more outlets that you might have, the more audience that you can grow from that. Absolutely. And so having things on even on Spotify and, and Apple Music and, and uh, Tidal and all of those or on YouTube. Or, yeah, the more people can act, the more ways people can ask it, because also we live in a day and age where people want things instantaneously. So if they love that piece of music, they want to play it for their friend. They don't want to have to search out your website, scroll through. Oh, the, it's, it, it's in this you know page within their site and oh, no, they want to be able to access it instantaneously with a, with an app. So having it accessible is only going to help you. And how about all yeah. of your touring, the Bonnaroo, Summerfest, Firefly, Secret Garden Party, and also what well, Austin City Limits, you've been on the Craig Ferguson show. How much did that help, in, in, you think, in terms of getting discovered? It, it's, I think it's all small little victories that add up. You know, I don't think there's one show or one performance. When we were going to do Craig Ferguson, we, we thought... And granted, that's the late, late yeah. show, so it's not the <laughs> it's not Letterman. But we were still like, oh, this is going to change change things. It's going to change everything. It didn't change anything, but it gave us this incredible opportunity. Craig was amazing. It it gave us a certain integrity when people would see that video. Yeah. You're all you're you're considered a little bit differently. Oh, they're a, more of a professional act. It allowed us to get some shows. We got some fans through it, so it absolutely helped. But it didn't make or break any of our career it was all of these things you know the festivals the shows here and there and sometimes it's honestly it's sometimes it's the shows where you play in some small town in front of 10 people and someone's there that might be the radio promoter for a bigger station but they love the band or they pass it on to a music supervisor you never know and i i i feel like it's really important to treat every opportunity to make music and create music as a gift and awesome. if you can share that gift and show that gift, in, in fact, a lot of times when we play the shows in front of smaller audiences, it's, it inspires us more to like really try and blow these five people's <laughs> minds. You know? Like, let's give them the show that we, we don't even give to a, a thousand people, right. you know, or 5,000 people because they came out like th they're here and they spent their money. And they're not worried that the room isn't full, or at least we're hoping they're not worried yeah. that the room is full. So let's let's give you know let's make it ten times what they paid worth you know worth it. Well, have you been watching vinyl on the HBO? I have watched the first two episodes. We're we're just hooked on it, at, uh, my wife and I. And it you know it's not the '70s anymore, and there's probably not you know no, the A and R people out there you know going to these uh, festivals as much. Or or do you how do you find it different? Let's say. You know, how is 2016 different than oh, it's 1978? Incredibly, it's incredibly <laughs> different. I mean, it's, you know, in the in the unromantic bad way, you don't have that same excitement of like the A&R who's just purely discovering. You may, okay, I don't want to say you don't, but it's so far and few between having this guy who's just passionate about the music. He's working at the record company because he wants to sign this great new artist, not because it's going to sell a lot of records, but because it's going to influence society. Yeah. It's going to influence culture. It's going to be this great new exciting piece of art. Um, that happens less and less because of the politics of the record industry, because it's become even more of an industry than it's ever become. I think it began as an outlet for artists to create work and ideally sustain themselves from it. It's less about that and it's more of a, a, a machine, certainly in the major label realm. That being said, you now are in a world that has so much opportunity for independent artists, independent labels. Even the, the, the record we released for The Detour, I, I I approached Turner and I said, guys, like, let's put out an album. Mm, interesting. And they're like, you don't know what. To... I'm like, we have all this music. People love the show. The show's getting excitement. We should have music out for it. And and they're like, well, we don't. Let's say, okay. I said, fine. I'll be the record label. I'll figure out how to do it. I'll release the album. I'll put it all together. You guys just sign off on it, and we'll put it out. And it was literally as simple as that. And I wow. feel like you couldn't do that even 15, 20 years ago, where you now have that ability to just self-release because it's all accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and we live in, in a, so the modern technology allows for a lot of innovation and excitement, but some of the romance has depleted from that world and hopefully it can be reinvigorated somehow.
That's the long answer to your great, short great. question. Um, so what other pieces do you think are important? What other ingredients, uh, for example, an agent, um, a PR, those sorts of things? What, what other things have you found to, to help boost uh, you know, your profile in your career? Um, being someone nice to work yeah. with, I think it's number one. Uh, like I'm currently doing a, a song for Full Frontal, Samantha B's show. Right, right. And so we're doing this comedy song there. The, uh, the national, the, the Republican national convention is happening in Cleveland. Things have gotten a little, uh, haywire. <laughs> They've gotten a lot of backlash. So we've created this song, uh, almost like a welcome to our city song, yeah. but about Cleveland most we've mostly got this in terms of the national convention so we're piecing it all together but the reason i feel like i got that is because i worked with samantha and jason and yeah. they i turned stuff in on time and i was a pretty reasonable guy to work with i didn't cause them too much grief and uh we got to be creative together they're also fantastic people to work with but having those relationships right. it, it, it encourages people to recommend you encourages people to uh to consider you to want to work with you again so that's i think the core thing that will attract more work but um but i think i don't have an agent currently so i don't know i mean i have an agent in other realms of my life and it can be very helpful um i don't know enough in terms of music composing specifically um pr does seem to help it's that's what i'm going through now is kind of helping promote my career we submitted for emmys we'll see right. who knows but hopefully we'll get you know some kind of response in that regard and then yeah doing interviews and and, and it also helps you figure out you know what do i stand for as a musician as a creator um and i get to learn from you guys as well asking really interesting questions your knowledge it feels so it's, it's all collaborative in my opinion well, we really, really appreciate you being here and uh, being so honest and so forthright about all these uh, tough questions. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, it's fun. Thanks for having me. Um, the final question I'd have is about video games, and I understand you're quite a video gamer yourself. A bit, I'm a big uh, FIFA fan oh, and a big Red Dead Redemption fan, which I think has incredible score. Like, when I played that game, it sort of changed my whole view of what is possible with video games. Because not only is the narrative great, and they include these incredibly funny details that make the story, it makes you want to keep playing the game, but the score and the music in that game is incredible. Yeah. I mean, I put it up there next to great series on television. Um, and Red Dead Redemption, for those who don't know, it's a uh, basically this a cowboy outlaw kind of Western game where you uh, made by the, the rock star group. So it's similar in a way to the, um, the grand theft auto yeah. games, but it's set back in the, you know, the heydays of the, I, actually it's on that cusp where what's interesting about it and their games too, is they bring a lot of historical elements. So that game in particular, it's set in the West. Um, and in that time, the pioneer time, but, on the cusp of when automobiles have just been created and the machine and guns have kind of been uh, more developed. So you have this interesting cusp of the, that old West with the new world that's starting to come in. So it's a great place to set a story and the game's fantastic. It's also a little bit like how you compose, right? right? Uh, uh, so Bill Elm and Woody Jackson, right? Uh, similarly, you know, got, you know, guitars and stuff hanging on the walls and, and have this very kind of fluid process in terms of like creation and things like that. And I think um, uh, it suited the game really well in terms of almost like a, it's not quite a song driven score. It's right. kind of halfway between say a song driven score and say um, uh, what Ennio Morricone did. For yes. The Spaghetti right. Westerns. Right. right? Absolutely. So. Yeah. You can hear that influence. And I love that sound. And you're absolutely, that's a great way to sum it up. And and there is one moment, there a, a song, it's almost like you, and it, they did it fantastically. You get to a certain point in the game, like quite far into it, like three quarters of the way in. And there's this incredible montage where this, this like folk song comes in with vocal 
And I don't know if it was done by the composer or if they licensed a song for it, but it's this incredible moment where this whole time you've been hearing this fabulous Western score with no vocal, and then all of a sudden, and you feel like, my God, I'm in a film. It's that moment in the film where that song comes in and like sweeps you away. And I literally felt, you know, my heart pounding and goosebumps like emotional. And I'll always remember that. And we were talking about a video game here, but it's like you've almost lived some of that experience. And now that we're getting into the VR world, the virtual reality and where we're going is just incredible. And, and I'm hoping to be a part of that world where we're creating experiences that people are going to live. And part of that is the soundtrack to that, the visual, all of it. And it's, it's only going to evolve into an even more complex and meticulous and amazing world, I think, that we're all part of creating. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for your time. I, I could talk all day about this stuff. I know Michael could too. <laughs> you guys are great. Yeah, it's been great. Well, Michael, hopefully I'll, I'll get to see you in Boston when we're out there. It'd be fun to- Absolutely. To Definitely look me up. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great one. Thank you for listening to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. Please visit us at designingmusicnow.com for more info, news, and reviews on this subject. We would love to hear from you.